So we've got six presentations uh, and I'm going to introduce each one in turn uh, and then we will come to questions at the end. The first one is on the virtual reading room, remote research and teaching at the John Islands. Um, the first presentation is by Dominic March, who is the reader engagement coordinator and Julianne Simpson, the research engagement manager at the University of Manchester. And over the summer of 2020, in response to the pandemic, and the uncertainty around physical access to the building for research and teaching, a small number of curators at the John Ryan's Library began to experiment with a visualizer and with Zoom, and with that, with the goal of starting an adventure that has led to an enormous, enormous amount of innovation, a lot of cables being, uh, being tested, and a real shift in how they're thinking about remote access to their collections. And I know this is a topic which many others are experimenting too, so it's fantastic to invite Julianne and Dominic to share their experience. Over to you. Thanks, Jess. Well, we have a recorded uh, presentation uh, as we're not in the building uh, today. We're here with you from home. Uh, so I'm going to share the video with you now. My name's Dominic Marsh, and I supervise the staff and service in our reading room here at John Lyons Library. Once we closed at the end of 2020, it soon became apparent we weren't going to be back in the building in the way we had been for a considerable time. As the lockdown began to ease in May, we began to look around for ways in which we could reopen, have a reopened or partially reopened service. So the problem we were trying to solve for, was twofold. Um, restrictions on travel obviously meant the researchers were either wouldn't be able to or would be reluctant to come into what is a Manchester City Centre building. Or secondly, restrictions on space within our with our reading room. I think it's around normally around twenty five uh, capacity. Um, it would have been reduced to four, a maximum of four, with the two meters social distancing regulations. So we needed to look at a way of getting to those researchers who wouldn't be able to come into the building. From June, when we were able to get back into the building. I was back in with colleagues um, looking at the technology and the ways in which we could offer this service. Luckily, we had a Wolf Vision Visualizer, um, which we bought for classroom teaching some years previously, but it hadn't been used in this way before. Um, it's a very intuitive piece of kit to use. Um, it connects up just by USB to your laptop and whichever app you're using in your laptop, we use Zoom or Teams, Zoom for external users and usually Teams for internal, um, but both work fine. And what those apps will do, they'll recognise the visualiser as a camera and give you the option for which camera you want to use. So we find that really useful um, to greet researchers at the beginning of a call and then change to the visualiser. And then we can say goodbye at the end as well. And it's just a, sing a single click to do that. The visualiser itself, um, it's obviously it's got its own light, it um, has also focus and importantly it's also got a uh, zoom and also um, a freeze button which we use um, to, to cut out all the um, page turning and the hands and all, and all that and the moving the item around so you, you, you would get a, a page or a sheet open for a researcher, you freeze that and then you can manipulate the item so that the next page is available, all the research sees at the other end of the Zoom call is, uh, is the original page and then the next page and the next page and so on. In terms of what the researcher sees or what the researcher does, people have used it in different ways, but I think the way it's going now, the two, the two most popular ways are people will do screenshots of the items that they're interested in, or they will record the whole session and, and watch back later. We treat it much the same as if someone was in the reading room in terms of copyright and so on. So we ask people to sign up to uh, to our copyright uh, copyright terms and conditions beforehand. So it's great for smaller items. So single sheets of, of letters or um, single volumes or manuscripts and so on. Um, it, it struggles a bit with the larger items. So uh, a folio it takes some manipulation because of the arm of the visualizer it can get in the way of it. Um, larger items you can manipulate the camera so that it focuses just sort of north of the bed and then you can put um, put the larger items on the table there what you get then is the also focus struggles a bit so I would say it's a, 
if you were going to invest in one of these, you would, you would want to look at the, the size of material that you're using most regularly. The service itself, um, we offer hour long sessions. We don't allow people to put more than one hour on the same day. Um, just because I think we, you know, we could end up spending all our time dealing with just one or two people, which, which what we're trying to do is to get the service out to as many researchers as possible. In general, we, although we have allowed people to book on multiple days, um, you know, people have used it very sensibly and, and we've maybe had people in for a week, two weeks, something like that has been the maximum. Um, most people are actually happy with the hour and sometimes slightly less than the hour. Um, it really works well for people who know exactly what they want and that that thing is, is fairly sort of concise. Um, so for example, someone who wants to view one letter, ideal, perfect. Um, someone who wants to view one volume, that's great. What it's less good at is those people who, who perhaps have seven or eight boxes of, uh, of an archive they need to go through. That can get slightly messy and there's a feeling I think that they don't get quite what you'd get out of it if you were sat in the room. In terms of like the amount of staff time that's involved, we have one member of staff would do a session. I don't think there's any need for more than one except where we've got very large items. So if you've got a large map or a big uh, folio that needs manipulating, moving around and so on, um, it can be helpful to have a second person there. It's been great. It's been really interesting because you, 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 you you get to know the collections a lot better because you're looking through things with someone who's fairly knowledgeable about what they're doing. I think that's about all I've got to say about the service. I would imagine though that we will, this will continue long after lockdown. Um, if you imagine being someone in, where in Manchester, so if, you, if you're up in Aberdeen or in London or on, uh, on, on the east coast of uh, the United States, it's a lot easier um, to have a 10 minute Zoom call to look at a few letters than it is to, to apply for and get research funding to travel over here. Um, so I, I anticipate this being um, yeah, a long-term service in one way or another. Welcome to the Christie Room at the John Rylands Library, which would usually host collection-based teaching as well as seminars and workshops. In particular, we are involved in teaching sessions for the MA in Medieval and Early Modern Studies with the core course being taught with collections in this room every Monday afternoon during the academic year. Though we started thinking early on about how to achieve the move online, it took some time to bring this all together and it is still a work in progress. In addition, we have the challenge of working in a grade one star listed historic building. It is important to note that advice and support from university media services and our own library imaging team was crucial to ensure the most effective setup. First of all, we have a video conferencing camera, which was already in place with a large screen. We've added to this a Roland mixer, which allows us to feed in multiple cameras via HDMI, which can't be connected directly to the laptop. I'm now going to do a demonstration of the three cameras that we have attached by sharing my screen in Zoom. And we're using facsimiles for this demonstration today rather than uh, real collection items. So first of all, we have an overhead camcorder, which is placed on a copy stand. And this is the, the one that we use the most in teaching. And we can zoom in and out uh, as we need to as well into the, the object. Secondly, we also have Another video conferencing PTZ camera, a point tilt zoom camera, which allows us to show larger objects. But additionally, we can also zoom in and you can get very close, close into the text, even with this camera. Thirdly, we also use a GoPro, which is something that we can use around different parts of the building for filming but with an added magnifying filter it's also very good for using in detail like with this map and you can move around to show different parts of the detail so i'm going to stop sharing now 
and show you also the other part of the work that we've done to support the students. And that is uh, digitization. We've used our platform, the Manchester Digital Collections, to provide a collection of digitized manuscripts and early printed books for the students. And these are all the ones that we will show in the virtual classroom. And as well, we have digitized what uh, they would normally be uh, used a, a group of books that they would choose from to do their a long essay for their assessment in the core course. And so they can use the digital copies, but also make use of the reading room service that Dom has already shown to have virtual consultations. As well as teaching, uh, we are now starting to investigate other opportunities to share the collections online. And we recently collaborated with the Bodleian Library on a joint seminar. It would seem that the potential for working in this new virtual space means that our virtual Christie room will be a permanent part of our future. Thank you very much, Julianne and Dominic. Uh, what a fabulous way to start our lightning talks. And it's just wonderful to see those innovations that are uh, springing up all over our libraries and that consideration of how they will have longer lasting utility uh, beyond the pandemic. And I know we'll come back to some of that in the Q&A. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Leo Marr into, uh, into the room again. And um, Leo uh, Marr is currently the head of uh, the Upper Campus Libraries of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome, Leo. And he's also a standing committee member of the IFLA Academic and Research Library se section. His presentation, he's going to talk about the experience of creating VR library tours during COVID-19 pandemic and also the lessons learned from his project. So a big welcome. You could hear us cheering for all in the room together, Leo, uh, for your presentation on creating a virtual library tour during COVID-19. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And I'm going to share my screen. I hope you, you can all see the screen right now. And um, uh, I'm Leo Ma from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And it is my great pleasure to share our experience on using, you know, on creating virtual library tour in our library during COVID-19 last year. And, uh, and uh, uh, here, uh, I will talk about a little bit about our CHK library. Uh, we have all together seven libraries, uh, two on upper campus, two in, on the central campus and two on lower campus. Uh, well, one in the medical library at the Prince of Wales Hospital, altogether seven. And I'm the head of the upper campus libraries. And uh, in this presentation, I will um, uh, mainly talk about the uh, CHK library VR project. Uh, we have, um, you know, a, de a, de a designated, uh, you know, web page uh, consisting of uh, all the VR, you know, videos uh, and uh, putting up on this, you know, web page. And in particular, I will uh, mention about, I will talk about, you know, um, the uh, New Asia College Chambu Library, as well as uh, United College of Wuchung Library. And uh, talking about our experience on creating the, you know, VR uh, tours for these two, uh, you know, upper campus libraries. Right now, uh, here is the timeline of our project. And uh, you can see uh, yeah, for the red highlight, which is the, you know, a, a the kind of, you know, a, a, the main project together with the, um, you know, university library, the main library, as well as the branch libraries. While the black highlight uh, uh, the, you know, higher timeline for upper campus. As you can see, we start our project on nine, uh, nine, uh, May 19, and then uh, we decide, you know, to create the VR tours. By that time, it is still in the first wave of COVID-19 in Hong Kong, and we, uh, we, we decide that we should, you know, move forward to create the uh, virtual VR tours uh, to prepare for the upcoming semester in September. So soon after our decision uh, to create the VR tours, then uh, I, you know, set up two uh, work teams uh, uh, on upper campus, uh, one, uh, two, coll two colleagues uh, in each team, so we have the first Zoom meeting uh, outlining our objective scope and timeline for our uh, VR project. And uh, we also have a, you know, external training sessions on June 19 to make sure that our staff are equipped with, you know, the necessary skill set for uh, using the uh, VR platform. 
And uh, then soon after that, uh, um, we schedule a weekly meeting and uh, kick off the video productions. And we have a series of you know uh, Zoom meetings because we couldn't go back to the library face-to-face. Uh, -face, so we have to go use you know, the Zoom meeting. And, uh, and then we have a weekly meeting for drafting, for reviewing, et cetera. And uh, we've, uh, you know, have a, a kind of, you know, a round up meeting finally uh, on the August 4th uh, so that uh, we kind of review all VR tools for our main library as well as branch libraries and standardize our formats, layout, et cetera. And finally, uh, we have the, the VR tour production on, you know, um, August 12th. So it's well before, well ahead of the, you know, start of the semester. As you know, uh, there are many, many, you know, uh, VR platforms, applications out there. Some might look uh, familiar to you. And we, uh, in CHK, uh, we decided to use a, uh, uh, what we call the ECVR uh, platform, which is a, a local, uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, local uh, start, uh, start up, you know, company in Hong Kong. And uh, the reason for using this uh, company because it is a you know a, 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 which is available for a, a PC, smartphone, and tablet cloud-based platform, and user can modify the content very easily, and we can place uh, place and access all VR you know data uh, wherever we go. Whenever we go, we can uh, upload our three hundred sixty degree panoramic photos uh, ourselves. Uh, here are the, some of the benefits of using this, you know, uh, platform. Uh, we can self-manage, uh, you know, our, our contents, upload our VR images ourselves. Our uh, uh, easy VR platform is a self uh, a device independent. Uh, we can use smartphone or, you know, and uh, a 360 degree camera very easily, uh, which is also cost effective. Uh, we can, you know, easy and free to build VR content. And we do not need to have any programming skill and knowledge. We can create our own content. Now, uh, this is the production you know, version of the um, you know, VR library tools in uh, uh, NAL and UCL. Uh, because of time, I couldn't you know, give you a, tour, uh, a real tour, but um, uh, these are the functional features available uh, uh, for this you know, VR platform. Uh, it, uh, broadly speaking, uh, they provide you know, uh, two types of you know, uh, uh, features. Uh, uh, one uh, internal navigation moving around in the within the library building, and we have the provide we have uh, can provide the external links, including sharing link to you know web, other web pages and uh, YouTube etc. Now here are the, some of the photos and images that we can enlarge while we want to you know look at uh, during our VR tours. Uh, we can we can highlight some of the artworks in the library. And we can, as, 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 as mentioned, uh, uh, we can, you know, uh, provide the social media, social link and external websites to our, some of the uh, services like a computer lab within the UCL library. And we also, you know, um, uh, kind of take the statistics uh, uh, between, you know, the productions uh, on um, uh, August 2012 uh, to uh, January 21st this year, uh, which is, um, you know, more, uh, more than 2000 uh, views. Uh, this is the um, UCL Anonet, uh, analytics, um, as you can see, the peak time coming uh, in October, you know, uh, last year. And uh, obviously, the reason is because the you know orient orientation uh, starts there. I mean, uh, we have the other workshops also provide to our users, and this is the NAL analytics again. The peak of the usage is in uh, October last year. And one of the highlight of this project is to we uh, try to make this project a, a, a kind of student engagement project. We apply the uh, what we call the uh, you know student campus work schemes um, by applying uh, some funding from the universities to recruit to hire our students to work in the project. And uh, we uh, I mean we need our we have to. Uh, recruit students with some skill sets, including, you know, of course, taking photos. Um, they have they have to know media editing. They have to know, you know, website design, and and, and of course, uh, communication skill is one of the most important part of the uh, skill set. Uh, in terms of the um, you know actual uh, task uh, for the students, they have to take you know 360 photos, create VR project scenes. Uh, they can they help us to input data and edit uh, the VR icons, uh, check format uh, consistencies, and finally proofreading of the VR scripts. 
Uh, we consider our project a successful one uh, because we have a very clear goal set, you know, uh, uh, upfront in the beginning of the project. Uh, we also adopt a, you know, team-based approach, you know, having, you know, staff and students working in each team. And we monitor the progress, having a weekly meetings, and as well as we, uh, you know, have a kind of and final round up meeting with together with uh, you know our main library as well as branch library, and uh, and of course the uh, it's very important that the uh, ECBL is a user friendly applications, and um, and of course uh, they provide you know professional training uh, to use this you know platforms. And, and finally, uh, uh, we also hire our students to, you know, work in this project and make this, you know, project uh, as appealing as possible to the users. And we do also have some lesson learns uh, after, you know, working on this project, uh, you know, during the uh, last summer. And of course, during that time, we, we have the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, or well, we meet, you know, a, 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 using uh, Zoom meetings instead of face-to-face -face meeting. Of course, we understand, you know, uh, the best forward, but the best way is to have the face-to-face -face, face -face meeting. But in that particular scenarios, we have to use Zoom meetings. And the second one is the skill required for using, you know, the 360 cameras and our staff are, you know this is new to our staff new to our students they have to have a learning curve to use this camera and the one lesson learned is to we have we should you know select the best photos best 360 photos before uploading and this is quite obvious that we should use the best photos but sometimes if you take 360 photos at a very sunny day it can be very tricky and uh, uh, also the uh, other lesson is about the format and layout consistencies before data input, uh, especially when we uh, have to manage you know, different libraries. And finally, uh, uh, ECBL is an easy to use application, but there are still some you know, uh, features that are desirable for us, but not available in this platform, like you know, uh, highlighting you know, directional, direct, directional icons that we would love to have. And uh, this is the, uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leo. That was wonderful and perfectly on time. So uh, a very professional presentation. I particularly like the integration of student engagement and participation. So they were helping to drive the outcomes. We will come back to you in questions. So um, I'm going to say goodbye for now. And I'm going to invite our next speakers uh, in. Uh, and so I'm going to um, invite uh, into, our, um, into our presentation Ian Gifford and Pete Morris, both from the University of Manchester. Uh, library um, and as an introduction to uh, to the work that they're doing, Ian and Pete um, are from the digital development team working at Manchester University Library, and they're going to be sharing their work on the development of real time digital dashboards. Uh, something which I'm sure we'd all really uh, value in our own institutions. So wonderful to see how you've done it, and in particular the application that they have developed in response to the initial lockdown last March in a bid to help raise awareness of the wide range of activity still taking place in the library and demonstrating its critical role in support digital university um, which is a, a great topic for us all and so um, urgent and important during the times we're through so Ian and Pete over to you. Thank you Jess so I'm going to attempt to share my screen okay and start the slideshow so I hope you can all see that okay um so yeah, I'm Ian Gifford. I um, lead the digital, sorry, lead the digital development team at the University of Manchester Library. And um, myself and my colleague Pete Morris, Pete Morris, who's one of the developers in my team, and I are going to talk about our work on live dashboards, as just said. Um, I'm going to start with a brief history of our work in this area and set the scene before handing over to Pete, who's going to talk in more detail about our most recent application. But I wanted to start by talking about why we've been particularly interested in live dashboards. Um, as you'd expect at the library, most data presenting and gathering is focused around static historical data. Um, and this come, can come with a, no, a number of challenges by itself, but bringing together real time data from multiple sources is potentially going to present even more challenges and perhaps um, particularly technically. Um, so why spend time on it, on it? Well, I've always felt there are unique benefits to be gained from having access to live data. For example, being able to react quickly to unexpected issues when services go down, being able to respond to sudden changes in demand. Do we need suddenly more staff on the front desk because of an influx of customers? And being able to spot um, unexpected variations in you know, 
established patterns of activity? Why aren't we getting the usage we normally do at this time? Do we need to change our comms? And being able to do um, fun things that are fun and interesting with live data and maybe bringing in elements of gamification. So we've been thinking about it for about five or six years now. Um, in the early days, it was very experimental. We ran a few team hack days to see what data we could get access to. And to be quite honest, it, it wasn't a lot. At least there was very little we could access in terms of real time events for our standard library systems. So we experimented a little bit with presenting data from our mobile checkout app, but we didn't get a lot of regular, regular usage, so it wasn't all that impressive. Um, we did, however, do some quite interesting mashing up of occupancy data from Sentry, our access control system, and data from the university's online directory. And we actually developed an application which updated this hourly and allowed users to interact with it via a web page. Um, people could select the date range and get up to the, an up-to-the-hour graph of occupancy data for different faculty, schools, and user types. And this was used for a number of years as a flexible reporting tool. And we also experimented a bit with some open source tools such as Google Data Studio, Grafana, Kibana, et cetera. But again, we were always really limited by the available data sources. That's just a, a quick um, uh, example of some of, the, some of the front ends that we've um, developed over the years. So um, after this, we have, we've had a bit of a fallow period for a few years. Then in 2019, um, two things happened. Firstly, uh, Pete joined the team and brought with him some um, experience of developing real-time dashboards to his work on the university's live clearing system. Secondly, we got a simple request from a group called the Library Incident Managers asking for a web page displaying the current live occupancy, the nearest second of our main library to help them deal with potential incidents. And it turned out this was actually um, fairly straightforward to do. Um, and we decided to revisit the whole possibility of live dashboards. And we actually found that things had moved on quite a bit. Not only was a webhook system in place for our LMS, Alma, returning live event data for book loans and laptop loans, et cetera. In the intervening period, we had created a digital form system supporting a wide range of services, such as student and book staff, student and staff book orders, lost property and library loans. And because we developed it, it was, it was fairly straightforward for us to build our own webhook system around it to get, get access to live event information. We also discovered some other university data sources, such as live PC cluster information from the central IT services team. So we ran a small project to try and bring as much of this live data as we could get hold of into a single interface. And at the time we were very focused on creating something that we could display physically in the building. And so we concentrated on in-house resources, physical visitors, print loans, PC cluster usage, et cetera, and developed something to display, to display on one of our in-house totem screens, which is essentially a giant mobile phone screen. And this um, was the result. And it was developed to be an interactive screen that users could um, touch and explore. So we experimented with building elements of AI to try and predict future occupancy and detect popular pairs and triplets of checked out items. We also enriched the data with faculty and user type information from our online directory. And we were about to, about to move to look on um, to look at personalization when just over a year ago, we were all in lockdown. And as soon as this happened, our, our totem screen um, was immediately redundant. And we, as we adjusted to remote working, we started to think about how we could remotely monitor our systems and digital services to make sure they were still working and also to see what the usage was like. And this coincided with some early feedback we were getting from other parts of the uni, that they, the university, that they didn't really realise the library was still open for business and offering a number of online services. So we asked ourselves, could we um, adapt an, uh, our totem dashboard as an online only dashboard and show people all the activity that's still going on in the library? And, and also, could we do it quickly? So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Pete and we're going to do a, a, a live attempt to do a live demo. There's a, um, a couple of links on there. Um, we've quite, if you um, are able to, we'd quite like you to go directly to the dashboard yourself on your own devices, if you can. Um, I think hopefully we can send those links around in the chat. Um, so I'm going to put up the live dashboard and hand over to Pete. Thank you, Ian. That's great. <clears throat> so as Ian mentioned, we had a lot of different systems and they each had their own counters, their own trackers, their own analytics. And generally, each person within our team had their own system or systems that they were responsible for. So the first thing we needed to do was go through a process of standardization before we could aggregate all of this data together. And we wrote API endpoints for each of the systems we were responsible for. And that allowed us to start to pull that live data together from each of those systems in a consistent manner and store that all in a central database. <clears throat> so to use the example on the screen here, we've got two systems, Unpaywall and LibKey, which are completely different systems, but we're able to display them side by side because we've, again, aggregated all of that data together. 
So the number of requests for the different systems we have can be displayed like that. <clears throat> One of the ways that we did this, the API endpoints that we made provide the consistency, but they're still all pull technologies. You have to keep refreshing the page. You have to keep polling them every few minutes to get any updated figures. And for a really live experience, what we wanted was to move towards push technology instead. So that when a transaction takes place, it's pushed to the system and pushed to your browser rather than us having to keep refreshing everything the whole time. So a system we use called Alma supports a technology called webhooks and webhooks allow us to tell Alma to push to a predefined endpoint when a transaction takes place, such as a student learning a book, for example. So when a student learns a book, that will update on the little moving one that you can see on the screen. That's our sort of our heartbeat of things that have been checked out today. And so we had to extend some of the API endpoints to accept these webhook pushes as well as returning data that they would. All of this is great from a background um, server database -y perspective, but you can't actually see anything using that. So in order to actually make something visually attractive, we had to look at technologies to do that. And we looked at a technology called Angular because this allows us to change off HTML, the static web pages onto a two-way data bind. So that as the data changes on our server ends, it updates automatically on your screen and that's a very different way of doing it. So to give an example of a dynamic update, we have a student who loans a book or an online resource using Alma. Alma fires a web hook to update our API endpoint and the endpoint in turn turns this into a web request and pushes that through to your browsers if anyone's got them open at the moment. So each time one of our students in real time actually checks out one of our books, your screen on your device will be updated instantly to see that. And that gives us a truly live experience we feel around that. And also the underpinning principle was to keep the page very text light. So if possible, I wanted to try and make it as graphics based as possible, because this wasn't really a report. It was, as we call it, a shop front or a digital dashboard. So you could see what the library at Manchester University was doing. So there was a lot of visual graphics, a lot of icons and symbolism rather than just explanatory boxes. If we scroll down to the bottom, Ian, you can see that um, using the Manchester Digital Collections that uh, Julianne mentioned earlier, so as we go right the way down, these are actual, as people are browsing Manchester Digital Collections, these images and tiles at the bottom are actually being loaded live in real time as people are using the system. But it's quite fun that. <clears throat> now that the university campus is opening up a bit more, we wanted to try and reduce the distinction between digital and physical. And so originally the dashboard was designed to just show our digital offerings during the COVID restrictions. But now we're seeing if we can also show our physical access as well. So you'll see in the middle here, um, a bit like we had the live book checkouts, we've managed to tie it into one of our systems called Sentry, which allows us to actually show our students enter and leave the building. And that's just quite fun to show that we can merge our physical and digital aspects together. So I'll hand back to Ian. Thank you, Pete. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that wraps it up for us basically. So look forward to answering any questions about that. Um, later on in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete and Ian. That was wonderful. And I can honestly say I want one of those. Uh, I love the way in which it both gives kind of business intelligence for responding to kind of user needs and learning from that, but also it's a great with digital storytelling uh, about the kind of the, the ways in which libraries are contributing to, to student and academic life through the pandemic, really visualized beautifully. So thank you so much. We're going to keep going uh, and have time for questions at, at the end. Uh, and I'm delighted to now introduce Lydia Healy and Sophia Lenahan from the Museums of the University. University of St Andrews. So um, as uh, Sophie and Lydia uh, um, come uh, ready to join us, I'll just give a little bit of introduction. They're going to be talking about exhibit storytelling with digital collections. Lydia and Sophie, with funding from the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund, have spent the last seven months working on the online storytelling with museum collections. They've been rapidly digitizing museum collections to be used in the sport of teaching and museums programming and in their presentation, they'll be using the exhibits tool. So I'm really excited about this. And I know so many members across the research libraries, um, both in the UK and much further afield, are working much more closely with their museum, archive, garden uh, and gallery colleagues. So fantastic to have you here. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. Uh, myself and Lydia are going to be introducing you to the online storytelling with digital collections project. 
giving you a quick rundown of our collections, followed by showing the exhibit website and taking you through some real life examples where it has been used to showcase the university's collections. Uh, this includes material held by the library, special collections and museums. We're going to be showing quite a few links today and flying through them. So if you'd like to navigate these on your own, I believe the links should be circulated for you to have a look by yourselves independently. Libraries and museums at the University of St. Andrews are responsible for the care of all collections held by the university, many of which continue to be actively used in teaching today. The library at the University of St. Andrews dates back to the early 17th century, but has been collecting books for around 600 years. The general collections hold more than 1 million volumes, a large ebook collection, thousands of print and electronic journals, academic databases, and an extensive DVD collection, which includes rare films and documentaries. Special collections held approximately 210,000 rare printed books, particularly strong in theology, classics, history, and English and Scottish literature. It also includes the university's extensive manuscript and photographic collections and the university archives, which date from the early 15th century. The museum collections relate to its history, personalities, and teaching of research fields. The collections have been forming since shortly after the university was founded between 1410 and 1414. Today, the collections contain approximately 112,000 objects, encompassing the heritage collections, ethnographic and Amerindu material, anatomy and pathology, chemistry, psychology, historic scientific instruments, geology, and in the Belpetigree Museum, zoology. Uh, so as you can hear, there's an awful lot of material, all with the unique challenges, uh, which we at the university have had to tackle this year. In response to COVID-19, museums and libraries at the University of St. Andrews had to pivot their practice to meet new demands for dual delivery teaching, with an emphasis on online resources. With an increase in digital emphasis in the years leading up to this pandemic, and the new vital need for online platforms to interact with collections, museums wanted to investigate new experimental ways to present online resources which could replicate an in-person experience as close as possible. Between March and August of 2020, museums teamed with the company Nemocene to create Exhibit, an online tool which allows for collections to be presented with a focus on the narrative, uh, and that website is what you can see now. In August, with funding from the Esme Fairbairn Collections Fund, myself and Lydia began a seven-month project to rapidly digitise museum collections to be used in Exhibit for teaching. We focused on updating 2D imagery and, where appropriate, creating new 3D models of our collections. By August, the entire digitised photographic and manuscript collection was available to use in exhibits, and by December, all existing digitised museum collections were available, as well as 200 newly digitised objects requested specifically for teaching. Uh, so from the exhibit main page, you are able to access some of our showcase exhibits that were made to demonstrate the tool's use. Any digitised collection which is IIIF, that is the International Image Interoperability Framework, and you can see why you usually use IIIF, uh, so IIIF enabled can be used with an exhibit. It is free to use and no login is required. However, if you'd like to experiment and make one after this talk, please do make sure to keep a hold of the editing link and the preview link as they won't be stored anywhere centrally. So once they are lost, they are lost. In the early stages of exhibit, it was launched internally for use by university staff and students. This included for delivering lectures, seminars, and a new format of assessment. Dr. Lania Kunani's exhibit was created as an alternative way to present information in her class for the classical tradition. This is where they explore classical influences on later art and literature. She used the zoom and describe function to highlight specific passages of text or images within Thomas Moody's journal on his travels through Switzerland in the early 1800s, providing context for his writings and the 18 original watercolors held therein. Dr. Kunani also made use of other institutions collections within this exhibit drawing comparisons between the imagery in Moody's journal and, for example, an etching by Piranesi held by Harvard Art Museums. Exhibit, in this case, has offered a really good alternative to traditional methods of presentation, such as Microsoft PowerPoint. It has allowed users to highlight key aspects and draw comparisons much easier. Whilst it's not the same as having these resources to view in person, it has offered a fairly close experience. Okay, thanks, Sophie. Um, so exhibit has also been used as a new form of assessment, as Sophie said, uh, in the absence of in-person teaching. The museum and gallery studies students, um, MLIT students, adapted their usual object study assignment to be completed within exhibits. So students are usually provided an object to create a report on, on the object's history without any supplementary information being provided. So this year they were given either 3D models or photographs of objects to investigate. So the zoom function of exhibit really allows the students to pinpoint specific areas of the object or print to discuss within their reports. 
Um, as we can see when here in one student's exhibit, they have zoomed in on features such as inscriptions and the figures depicted to give context to the print for their assessments. So if you just quickly pick through, they zoomed in on the parts that they want to talk about. Outside of teaching uses, the museum has also used exhibit as part of our online programming. Headspace is a guided mindfulness activity which uses exhibit to look closely and mindfully at a work of art. Here we have a print by Elizabeth Blackadder, a Scottish painter and printmaker. The exhibit guides the viewer through, focusing on different parts of the print, giving prompts to imagine sights, sounds, and smells beyond the prints. So here we have zooms into the signature of Elizabeth Blackadder, prompts viewers to think about the texture of the cat's fur, maybe their personalities, imagining kind of what they're like maybe some movements rather than just seeing the static print, thinking about whiskers twitching, sounds that you might hear, um, the cat's purr, and also focusing on the colors and thinking about smells that could be evoked from this print. So this also um, shows the scroll function of exhibit, which gives a different view of going through the exhibit as we've seen in the previous two. Um, and this can be added just to any exhibit by typing the scroll command of the exhibit URL. So there are different options when viewing your exhibits. Um, an exhibit can also be used with any digitized collections which are IIIF enabled. This means if individuals can create exhibits which draw comparisons between their collection and others to use them help illustrate a story. Um, this exhibit on Jane Austen uses multiple collections. If you go down to the information button here, you can see information about the item used and what collection it came from, including a link to the record on their collection website. So here we have the exhibit starts off with a print and manuscript from the Library of Congress. And it also handily pulls through all of the copyright information for you. So you don't have to worry about other institutions and um, copyrights when you're using the material. Um, this, oh, this also shows that you can link to kind of further material you want the people to see after viewing the exhibit. So these are linking you to other sketches that could be kind of supplementing material to what they're showing you. Then the exhibit moves on to a manuscript from the Bodleian Library, which is also IIIF enabled. And then we have a photograph from our collection here at St Andrews by James Valentine, which you can see at the bottom of Jane Austen's house. And then we also have this 3D model from the British Library. So this really nicely shows exhibits function of being able to pull through 3D models, which we've been using a lot at St Andrews, digitizing our museum collections. And you can like spin it around and zoom in. So it's a really nice function showing 3D objects when we can't see them in person at the moment. So this shows the variety of material that you can use in exhibit, um, which including your own collections if they are already IIIF enabled. So internally, we have had a lot of positive responses from staff and students using exhibit as an alternative way to create narratives and presentation of collection objects. The exhibit tool is continue, continuing to being built on and improved. Um, in the future, audio and video elements will be able to be added to exhibits. Anyone can use the exhibit tool, so please feel free to have a go with it and explore some of our collections or your own if possible. And please feel free to contact me or Sophie with any questions you might have about using exhibit. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, both of you. I think you're going to have a lot of inquiries after that. It's, be <laughs> it's beautiful um, and it's fantastic to see how over the last few years these, these tools have become better and better and more, more interactive. Um, it's it's, it's um, also lovely to think of the ways in which the experience and the immersion has been built into that, for instance, with the how you might uh, come to contemplate and sit with the Elizabeth Blackadder uh, um, print and others. So thank you so much. We'll come back in questions. That's really enjoyable. Thank, thank you. you very much. I'm delighted to invite in our next speakers now, um, Argula Rublak and Kate Wilcox, both from the Senate House Library. So welcome to Argula and Kate. Taking History Day online, switching from in-person to digital engagement is their presentation. 
Uh, Argula is the Academic Librarian of History Collections at Centre House Library, University of London. And Kate Wilcox is the Reader Experience and Technical Services Manager at the Institute for Historical Research. And they've been co-organizers of the History Day event, which uh, is on the calendar for many as an annual event, collaboratively bringing together students, researchers, and anyone with an interest in history uh, with professionals from the archive, library, publishers, and others in order to um, stimulate research and engagement. So uh, absolutely delighted to have Kate and Argula, and I'm gonna pass over to them for their presentation now. Yeah, I'm just going to start off with a brief introduction, then we're going to show a short video and then Argula will continue. History Day has been an annual event since 2014. It's consisted of a physical fair at Senate House in London with stands showcasing collections and an accompanying programme of talks and workshops. It's evolved from discussions at the History Research Libraries Committee. We talked about how librarians and archivists regularly promote each other's collections when dealing with inquiries. The event has benefits in bringing together collections, professionals and researchers in one space. It also proved a good opportunity for collection staff to catch up with one another. The scope has widened out to encompass all the library, archive, museum and gallery sector as more people got involved and a diverse range of collections are included. It was clear early in 2020 that we wouldn't be able to have a physical event. We had to move pretty quickly to bring the event online. We wanted to capture something of what makes the physical event distinctive, the opportunity to discover collections and engage with the staff who manage those collections. We were aware of the difficulties of 2020. Many staff were on furlough or without access to the collections. And we wanted to provide a wide range of ways for people to get involved, from pre-made pre -made blog posts to videos to live interactive events. We're now going to share a video showing some highlights from last year's event. That has given you a nice little flavour of how last year's event went and now I'm going to just present to you a few of the lessons we learned from holding the event online. So um, we think overall that the online version of History Day was really well received by um, the museum, libraries, archives and galleries community. We were able to shift our usual offer online and give our audience a new experience of discovering history collections during lockdown. Collections and audience engagement with the event underline the importance of digital outreach by and across research libraries to increase options to discover and research history collections remotely. 
feedback we received also, as I already mentioned, gave us a few pointers of what we could change and learn from our experiences for the 2021 event. So first of all, we learned to adapt to the different ways in which history collections are discovered online. Walking for a physical fair is, of course, a fundamentally different experience from exploring new content online. But we wanted to try and replicate the experience of stumbling upon different collections as much as possible. By offering organisations the option to contribute in multiple ways, we provided a wide selection of content for audiences that they could choose to engage with. The Discover Collections Gallery worked quite well as a first step to bring all the different types of contributions together. But for this year, we want to improve the functionality of our website uh, to give our audience more options to browse and explore. And we also learned that it was surprising what you could do with relatively low tech solutions. Really, all we had was a WordPress website, a Zoom license, and the institutional social media accounts and websites as well. And with only these tools, we were still able to get creative and hold a varied interactive program and to build a completely new platform for promoting collections. We learned about the benefits of the online format, which brought many new people to History Day who hadn't been able to come before. We were especially pleased that the programme appealed to both the academic audiences of students and researchers that we usually attracted at the physical fair, as well as the wider public audience that we were able to get with our online outreach. However, we were also aware that this widening of access um, might, and this change in our audience implied that we might have made the event inaccessible and therefore potentially exclusionary in some other ways as well. And we're starting now to explore the possibility of holding a hybrid event in the future to bring together the strengths of the online and, and in-person elements. We also learned about the importance of having a single coherent event platform that could provide a focal point for the event. We did try to bring together all the event bookings across the different participating organisations on our WordPress site and linked out a lot to different events that other organisations were holding. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a bit of confusion about the processes. So now we're considering an online event platform for this year, that audience, so audience have a single environment that they can interact with throughout the day rather than, rather than having to click across different websites. So just to quickly summarize, here are some of our tips of uh, some quick tips for what we learned um, from shifting from physical to online engagement. So first of all, work with the tools you have. They might be able to perform better and be more flexible than you think they are. Um, try to provide multiple ways of contributing and interacting with your event. Think about the ways in which you might be excluding your audiences and if there's any way you can mitigate that. And finally, try to provide a focal point by building a coherent platform for your online experience. So that just leaves us with a final slide. What we've given you here is first of all, a link to the uh, website where you can find all the content from last year's event. And it's also available. So you have a browse around if you want to. And we would also like to uh, encourage you to participate in this year's History Day if you would like to. If you'd like to find out more about how History Day works, if you haven't participated before, you can email us at historyday at london.ac.uk and the link and uh, the email address is on the slide as well for you to get in touch with us. We'd also like to let you know that we are really delighted that we are part of the DCDC conference this year with a smaller version of History Day, sort of a mini History Day basically. And we'll be sending out a call for contributions for this event really soon. So if you'd like to have a chance to be, be featured at DCBC, we'd really love to hear from you. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you so much, Kate and Arkida. That was wonderful. Uh, and everyone's keeping so brilliantly to time. I do appreciate it. I'm really enjoying uh, the different examples, the contrasting examples in our different settings of that pivoting uh, that has gone through so quickly uh, in, in, in our libraries in order to uh, bring forward new services that, that are um, essential um, and adapted for our time. And, and uh, I really enjoyed your um, you reminded to us that low tech can work, you know, it, it, you can you can try things and, and develop tools you already have. And also crucially, you know, reminding us about um, the need to think about who you might be excluding and that digital exclusion.
inclusion has been a critical part of this conference, I think, and coming through in lots of ways. So thank you both very much. We'll bring you back in for questions shortly. And we're going to come to our final speaker, um, Kieran Clark. Um, and I'm really delighted that we'll end the conference um, on a presentation which is about kindness uh, and compassion and what could possibly be more appropriate um, at this point um, in the world in which we are living. So Kieran Clark is the Library Administration Supervisor for Sussex Library. He manages the social media channels and other digital communications. He has shifted the direction of the channels and introduced new ways of managing a social team that to embrace a hybrid model. And his background is in special career in public libraries, and this has informed much of his approach in a social strategy for Sussex. Uh, transformation through kindness, tonal shifts in the University of Sussex Library, Kieran. Perfect. Okay, so hi, I am Kieran Clark, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so I want to talk about kindness, and more specifically, radical kindness. So when we think about kindness, we usually think about uh, we think of friendliness, warmth, and um, we think about qualities like um, empathy and diplomacy. I want to talk about how we can take that further to include qualities like vulnerability, integrity, compassion, subjectivity, and courage. So an institutional tone is usually one that is friendly, um, approachable, neutral, kind. But what does it look like when you inject radical kindness, um, especially against the backdrop of a global pandemic? So we've adopted radical kindness as the backbone of our tone. Um, it's a voice that's empathetic, understanding, infused with integrity. Um, and we've done this by being playful, um, by being vulnerable, and by shifting away from institutional neutrality when it matters. Um, We've also done this during an incredibly uncertain time. And one of the main reasons for this is we see our channels as social platforms and not as broadcasting channels. Um, we've also done this by adopting a hybrid model of working and by recognizing that people are at the center of our story. So what we wanted to achieve, um, we wanted to inform our users um, in a rapidly shifting and very stressful landscape. Um, we also wanted to create stronger connections with our audience. And we wanted to make our tone representative um, so that we could actually live our institutional values. Um, we know that since the pandemic, users have increased how much they're using social um, for updates, for entertainment, but also for comfort. Um, so we needed to give people accurate, timely information but it also needed to be done in a tone that was reassuring and compassionate. And we did this by listening to our audience and we reached across our networks and we prioritized two things, authenticity and silliness. Um, we talk a lot on our channels about mental health. Um, so kindness is not just about being nice, it's about providing care it's about breaking down barriers and stigmas. We wanted our users to know that the conversation isn't um, about toxic productivity, but about mental wellness as a goal in and of itself. So COVID-19 has taught us to slow down. Um, social has also faced a lot of criticism for its effect on well-being, but since the crisis, users actually report that they social has helped them with feelings of isolation and loneliness. And one cause is that users don't feel a need to show an unrealistic image of themselves. So we have leaned into that. We've shown a more vulnerable and more authentic side of ourselves, and we put ourselves um, out in the front of our stories. Um, we know that our users want fun and creative content, so we've given them behind the scenes posts. And this has um, been a great way for us to have some banter with our audience to connect in a digital space when we can't do that in person. Um, being at home has also, uh, all the time, has also means uh, being less polished. So that's something that we have embraced. Um, being entertaining and being a bit sillier, these have been top priorities for us in our social strategy meetings. Um, kindness is about giving people a bit of distraction, giving them a break, 
Um, so this year we focus less on vanity metrics and more on building relationships. We also know that channels that prioritize silliness see results. So our approach is to blend humor and uh, radical kindness. So I'm just gonna show a quick video. And this is one of our sections, uh, section videos and um, to highlight um, what we've been doing with the library since COVID. Um, there's also a more serious side to what's happened since COVID. Um, so Sussex is a university that has radical roots. Um, part of our shift has been to move away from institutional neutrality to one that also values subjectivity, um, whether that's queer, racial, cultural, or around accessibility. So our posts have also highlighted um, and addressed racism in higher education. This is a shift that needs to happen, and um, one that has been very slow, um, but we've been very deliberate and thoughtful in what, how we address it. And it's one that starts with decolonizing ourselves and embracing anti-racist values, but also acknowledges how far we need to go, and knowing that traditional tools have been used to perpetuate racist structures. Um, our voice is also one that acknowledges our history. So, it's a voice that is often queer. Radical kindness in this instance is about us acknowledging social justice and honoring our audience, particularly our Sussex audience, um, because at the heart of our channels is our audience. Um, everything we do is audience led and we know what they expect from us and that we need to deliver that. So I wanna talk about the way that we did it. So we did it by flattening hierarchies we created social media champions group and um, we veered away from a top down model of social media. And um, so champions from each library section were skilled up and trained. And we now have a team of people creating content, generating ideas, liaising with colleagues, adding skills and creating value. Um, and we have added their voices while also retaining that spine of radical kindness. Um, we do have a long way to go in terms of representation, especially in regards to race, um, but we have seen results. So in the last year, our Instagram following has increased by 53%, um, and that's by far where we see our most engagement and where that tone is most demonstrated. So COVID has taught us a lot of things. Um, it's taught us that our tone and our voice is fundamental. Um, that shift has had many strands, but the core of it has been radical kindness in how we speak. Um, we've done a lot of things. We've prioritized silliness. We have brought social justice to the foreground. Um, we've shifted away from neutrality and we've tried to embody authenticity. So this is about staying true and living to uh, living up to our institutional values, but also elevating them. Um, and at the core of all of that, we have also developed empathic care and support into our voice in a very um, challenging time. So if you want to follow along with us, you can follow at Sussex Library across Twitter, Sussex, uh, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kieran. I'm going to be signing up to your Twitter immediately after this presentation, and there's some genuinely kind comments in the chat, so do have a look at those. There's also a question uh, which you, which might want you to follow up afterwards about whether you've got any source material that helps to give some kind of background to you know, how one approaches radical kindness, the connection to silliness. Uh, so, you know, I think it'd be great if there's things you could post or, or, or um, a follow up um, from that, that would be great. Uh, I'm almost tempted to leave the conference there uh, on the note of compassion kindness and authenticity and silliness um, 
but we're going to bring everyone back into the room. So could I encourage people to turn back on their videos and we're going to just come back together as a group as a whole. That's great. Um, and first and foremost, can I just say a huge thank you to everybody. Um, that was fantastic. And you've each really um, kept our attention and you'll see in the chats and comments about how an uplifting close that has been um, to uh, what has been a tremendous conference. We've got time for a little bit uh, of Q&A together um, and we've, we've had a few questions in. I'm going to pick up on one of those um, uh, uh, from actually from Michael Williams, who's a colleague of mine here at the University of Cambridge. Um, and I'm really looking for hands for this one because it could be any one of you who answer this. I probably can't do all 12 of you or yeah, yeah, 10 of you at once, but let's um, let's say, that, so, so Michael says it's a great set of presentations and I couldn't agree more. It really, really was and, and very inspiring uh, from each of you with, with different takes and different tools. You've shown us your successes. Um, where we also learn, of course, is where things perhaps don't work out as we're going through that process of design. Uh, and also, um, you know, the things we have to say that didn't work, let's try something else. And I wonder if anyone is willing to kind of give uh, a, a taste of uh, what didn't work so well and what you learned from it on the journey. You're telling me, oh, Sophie, thank you. I'm going to say it can't all, so I'll come to uh, Sophie and then Kieran, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't see if there was like a raise hand function, so I figured I'd just go old school. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so obviously with Minor Lidia's talk, we're talking about the exhibit tool, um, which we have seen a really good uptake of. Um, we've been, over the past seven months, we've started receiving feedback from staff and students, which is usually overwhelmingly positive, but a trend we noticed was there didn't seem to be as much uptake as we had initially hoped for. Um, and it seems, especially amongst the academic community, because they had to make such rapid changes over really short periods of time they weren't looking for innovation they weren't looking for the new the jazzy the flashy they just wanted what they could develop quickly and easily um, especially with things like lectures and seminars some of them only had a period of weeks to get entire series online um, so that was one of the shortfalls we faced was the fact that actually people just didn't have time to engage with something that is this new where you require you know lots of support um you require training videos to help them find all the resources it just takes a lot of time um so kind of to combat that we've just had to really keep up the word about exhibits um we launched way back in october and we are still doing you know conferences such as this to keep the word out there that this is a tool that is available and people can use um and luckily now that you know things are kind of entering a more steady routine people kind of know where they stand with everything uh, it is you know it is still having a really good uptake um so yeah that was one of the issues we faced was actually whilst this pandemic has offered such a fantastic opportunity to try new things um not everyone wanted new things <laughs> some people just wanted what was familiar thank you that's a that's a great observation and um it, it, i i have no doubt at all that exhibit will have a life beyond and will to be developed so um thank you kieran you're going to come in as hi yeah i was just going to say just uh yeah on that the nice thing about working in, in social media is that um yeah your failures are very public and immediate so your audience very much leads you where you need to go so that's something that we really built into our social strategy was if it's not working you just ditch it immediately and um, and you'll really be led by that from your audience. So, you know, you might think that a photo is going to work or a video is going to work or even a particular, um, you know, a campaign on a particular issue is going to work. And you just sort of have to be very brave about things and um, meet, put your foot forward and not be afraid to make a mistake as well, because that's the only way that you can make content that's actually interesting and engaging for people is if you're willing to take a bit of a risk. Thank you very much. That's really well said. Um, Julianne. I just wanted to pick up on, on what Sophie was saying as well about the, the, the take up. So for, for us, especially with the teaching, we obviously, as I mentioned, we have the MA in medieval and early modern studies, uh, which is so embedded in special collections that it didn't seem like there was you know, any other, other option for those classes. But we had hoped 
to continue to do some of those special collection sessions with uh, other courses who would normally have visited us um, previously. Again, we, it, we didn't find much enthusiasm for it, either A, because the number of courses was cut back, the, the amount of teaching was cut, and so some of those smaller courses tended to be cut for this, this year, but also I think people, the academics just didn't have the capacity to, to think about how might this work virtually rather than a physical visit to special collections. Thank you, Julianne. I think, you know, um, we have all had different bandwidths at different times during the last months as well, haven't we? And so I'm guessing that um, that ability to respond and react is, is, is was true for staff as well as for other people using our services. We've had to be sensitive through that throughout. I'm going to uh, move on from that to, to a follow-up question that we had, um, uh, which was around, a can you give us a flavour of the user responses to the new tools uh, that you've been developing on your approaches? Uh, and what have you learned from those? And I'm actually going to come, if I may, to um, Ian and Peter first, if I may. Ian, Pete first, forgive me. Because uh, one of the questions was, how people responded, users responded to see this data uh, that you have made available using these different ways. And, and has there been any resistance to how their data, albeit aggregated up, has been used? Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask the first question and I'll pass over to, with Pete for the second one. Yeah, in terms of the immediate user response, um, it was all, I don't want to give Pete a big hair, but it was mostly about how good it looked, about the visual impact of it and how kind of, um, yeah, how sort of that the impact it, it gave immediately on showing, kind of showing all the various things going on in the library. We did have, we had lots of um, nice comments from other institutions. In fact, we got contacted quite quickly by a number, sort of the Bodley and the National Library of Scotland, a number of other institutions trying to find out how we did it, <laughs> if you like. So that, that was nice. Um, there was a lot of feedback from colleagues and one of the things that they found very um, helpful was this idea, you know, we had all this feedback about people not being aware of what the library was doing, particularly in those early months, you know, because it was physically closed, a lot of people just assumed that that was it for the library, we weren't doing anything. So being able to send somebody a link to kind of show them all, the, all you know, there's a number of services represented on the dashboard, um, that it was really, yeah, they really appreciated being able to kind of show, well, listen, let, just have a look for yourselves and you can kind of see what we're doing and, and the number of services we're supporting. Um, and there were some other comments around, um, particularly, uh, I mean, there were questions around the data we were displaying when people sort of stop and actually look at what we've been displaying, particularly around the e-resource data, because we've integrated um, LibKey and Unpayable, but there's, we, we haven't got complete access to all the e-resource data, that would be the sort of holy grail of being able to sort of show the complete range of e-resource access. And I know OCLC are kind of um, hope, working in the background, I think, to provide that, that kind of um, API access to that sort of data, but that would be, you know, the one huge um, leap forward if we could if we could all have that um in terms of the uh, yeah the kind of um the the sort of so security aspects of it. i mean pete did you have, do you want to pick that one up because we have sort of yeah sure that, that's a that's a a really cracking question that one and it's very multifaceted there's f ethics and all kinds of stuff that comes into that. I mean, from a purely technical level, one of the things we decided early on is that we wanted the data we were collecting to be uh, fully anonymous. And I spent a lot of time using hashes and various other algorithms to make all of the data we were collecting one way. So we could say that a X number of students have come in and so many from this faculty or something like that, but there was no way of going backwards and saying that then points to this student and so on. And I'm reasonably happy with what we came up with with that. Um, but you're right, there is a, a trade off in everything between personalization and these, I, I like the word you use actually surveillance, I think that's a very good word. There's a big trade-off that has to be done there and navigating that is a minefield of different things. I think the approach that we've used, um, I'm comfortable with. We don't gather any data which could identify any particular person um, and it's all just summarized data. But actually when you look at some of the uh, data that for example is collected by Google, it's absolutely terrifying i mean you that they will 
amass how many people are in our library buildings just from the mobile phone signals that you know various androids have and then i think it times it by 1.5 or something to get the number no probably 2.5 to get the number of ios devices or something so it's it's absolutely terrifying the amount of surveillance data that's out there you're absolutely right um so it's a constant balance uh, balance between those two things but there you're right there's huge ethical questions around presenting data that could identify individuals Thank you both so much. And I should say that was a question from Nadine uh, Chambers, uh, and it was a really stimulating one. Um, I wonder whether uh, Kate Aguilar or Leo, um, in terms of user responses, is there anything you could tell us about what you produced and what uh, your users have responded to to those new products? Perhaps Leo, if I could bring you in first. Thank you. And actually, um, yes, uh, I mean, um, there is a question also in the Q&A talking about, you know, um, is there any surprise uh, giving it to us uh, while we engage students in our project? And this is the kind of, you know, uh, uh, interaction and communication with our students, uh, you know, working in this project. And, uh, and actually, uh, we work in a team base, and in each team, uh, we have our staff, we have two staff uh, in each team, and, and also engage with one student helper uh, working on this project. So they, uh, they, you know, they discuss, you know, among themselves, work in a partnership, so that uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, what they suggest uh, will be, you know, kind of appropriate for us to put up on our, 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 our library tours. So it is kind of communication that can uh, be appealing to students as well as, you know, uh, uh, that can be used in the library. And in terms of the, you know, um, the response from the users about the uh, library uh, virtual tours. And actually, as you can see in the um, analytics, it is um, quite popular, especially during the uh, sem uh, uh, semester start uh, time. But uh, of course, uh, what we have to do more is uh, how to promote you know, this uh, virtual library tours and, you know, kind of uh, publicize this, you know, uh, VR tours in our, you know, uh, what we call the general education program, which is a compulsory, you know, courses for uh, each and every, you know, uh, newcomers, our freshmen to our universities. This is a very good opportunity to publicize, you know, uh, our virtual library tours as well as other library services to our students. So uh, this is uh, how we move forward. And of course, uh, we have a, de a designated web page and we, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, share these, uh, you know, names to our users in all and uh, every, you know, workshops so that. Uh, uh, we can have the opportunities to publicize these, um, you know, services to them, and uh, and indeed, uh, we have to do more in the coming semester to make sure that uh, this is, I mean, the virtual uh, library tours will be useful for them. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to um, just pick up, if I can, on those of you who are working with historical materials, which was uh, about half the presentation, Sophie, Lydia, Kate, Aguilar, uh, Juliana, and Dominic, and um, wonder, you know. Where does this lead you um, in terms of kind of your thinking about the relationship between the digital and physical objects and the kind of future ways in which users might, um, how you might work with users? Argula, you're going to come in, please. Jump in, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the eternal questions, isn't it? How do you combine the physical and the digital experience? I think our experience with History Day was really positive and that one thing we were really able to do, which we were never able to do before, is really reach this national audience. So we were usually quite London-based because our event was in London and for the very first time, we we're just able to reach this huge national audience and that showed one of the real advantages of going digital. And I don't think by only focusing again on physical events, we'll be able to achieve this effect again. So I think digital will be quite crucial in how we do our outreach in future and how we also compose History Day in our case. Um, but we had a fair bit of feedback as well from people who said they really missed the physical fair and this idea of really talking in, in person and um, seeing people who represented um, different collections at the fair. So um, I think it's a bit of a tricky one. And um, we've had many different discussions about this, of if we could just sort of alternate one hype, one physical event and one digital event and so on. And I think really um, we'll just have to go ahead and experiment in future and see what happens. Um, I think really this year, if anything, has shown us that we just need to keep experimenting and seeing what works and adjusting time and time again to whatever new landscapes we face. 
That's really helpful. Thank you, Aguilar. I, uh, Lydia, Sophie, um, I, I'm reflecting on projects I've been involved in in the past where people uh, uh, um, described having a different experience online and, and it's not about one or the other, but there were different things that you could do in that space. And I wonder what you've observed in, in that context. Yeah, I think um, the museum and gallery studies uh, is an interesting example because, you know, usually they would come in and handle the object themselves, which is obviously, you, you can't really replace that. But with them, um, so me and Sophie have been, we've been the two people, we, we kind of learned from scratch how to make the 3D models in the last few months. And that has a huge benefit in that you can take more time, you know, it's just a record online, you can zoom in on things that you might miss you know if you're in a kind of pressured environment examining it in the museum store um, and the high detail of like IIIF and the 3D models can allow for a bit more time and consideration um, but again it's just you know it's also really nice to come in and hold the objects and get a sense I think scale can be a problem with our 3D models and things like that um, but then again, you could handle things that are maybe more fragile that the museum and library wouldn't want you to be leafing through or picking up. So yeah, it's really, really tricky. It's been obviously really useful this year and I think it will still be used because again, it's handy for if you can't travel to St Andrews, but yeah, I mean, it's the whole <laughs> museum and libraries debate of between the physical and digital. But I mean, even before this, like everyone's trying to move towards more digital offers. So I think the tools we've developed, everyone's developed this past year will continue to be really helpful. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to um, close with a final version of that question to Julianne and Dominic, and then we will have to, to draw for a close. But Dominic and Julianne, um, I, I, I'm aware that other, some of the special question services are also uh, experimenting with the virtual uh, tools that you envisualize that you are for the reasons you are, you are, have done so during the pandemic. What do you see as their utility um, beyond these times? I think if I, I'll, I'll go first, Julian, that's okay. Um, I think it, it will be, in, once we're out of the pandemic, out of the lockdown, I think it will be an additional service and it, and it will have a role. Much like Lydia was saying there, there, are, there will be people who need to touch the items, they need to hold the books, um, for some, and also there are people who need to, say you look at an archive, you're looking at, um, you need to go through kind of 40 boxes, you're going to want to spend a week in Manchester, you're not going to want to do that from an office um, elsewhere in the country, so, you know, the, both, both um, ways of interacting with the material have a future. I think, for us, because at the moment we've got lots of staff time, so we can we can afford to spend an hour with, with a researcher, almost being a research assistant. I imagine post-pandemic, when we've got researchers in the, in the room again, we're not going to have as much time. So it may be that we move to possibly to, to charging or some, you know, some sort of model like that. Um, but there's absolutely no chance that, that this, this service will end. It's got a real future here. But if you want to say anything, do we have about the teaching? There's, there's two parts to uh, what we're, we're looking at in, in particular. So I mentioned the, the workshop that we did with the Bodleian um, a, a month or so ago. And today I've just uh, agreed to do an, another one with UCL in May. And that will involve uh, libraries in Florence and uh, the Morgan Library in New York as well. So they, that's the sort of thing that we just... We had the, the capability before, but we just never thought of doing it. So I think it's just that that, that opportunity and the, the idea of bringing, particularly bringing specialists together. And when you've got really rare and unique items, they might be spread across the world. It's an opportunity to actually see them phys physically, but virtually, <laughs> so virtually physically at the, at the same time. But secondly, we've also struggled for, for quite some time now in thinking about how we might do sessions for larger groups, particularly for, say, first and second year undergraduates, because we can't fit them all into a seminar room and looking closely at collections. So I think that's another, I'm hoping that's another area which we can develop so that we might be able to do the, those similar sorts of sessions, but to a big group of students. 
Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Um, what, what strikes me is, is, is not only the profound kind of innovations that you've all brought to your services in this time, but also how profoundly people orientated they are and that at the heart of what we do, we're about you know, connecting the communities that we serve and support. And uh, that came through all of the presentations that you did. And, and it was also lovely to end with Kieran's with that you know, very, very strong um, social ethical values framework, which I think we can probably all relate to. So thank you all so much.